there are numerous stories of merfolk, especially mermaids, in Scottish lore. The stories of these half-human, half-fish creatures have been part of the fabric of the country for centuries, with sightings all along the coasts. On 25th May 1809, Elizabeth Mackay, the daughter of the Reverend David Mackay of Ray in Caithness, wrote a letter to Mrs Mary Innes, the dowager of Sandside House at Ray. She told her of seeing a mermaid of the North Coast on 12th January that year. Although she knew it was considered improbable and fabulous, she implored Mrs Innes to take what she wrote as a matter of fact, in part due to other witnesses to the phenomenon, which she hoped would remove any doubt of the wonderful appearance I have reported having seen in the sea. That January day was bright, crisp and sunny. It was around noon that Miss Mackay was out walking with her cousin, who was said to have been one of four witnesses to the spectacle, when she noticed three people sitting on a rock some distance away. This group showed signs of terror and astonishment at something they saw in the water, so Miss Mackay and her cousin approached them. They pointed out something resembling a human face floating on the waves. Nothing but the face was visible. The sea was high, and as the waves rolled in, the mermaid gently sank beneath the sea, only to reappear shortly afterwards. She wrote, It may not be improper to observe, before I proceed further, that the face, throat, and arms are all I can describe. All our endeavours to discover the appearance and position of the body being unavailing. According to her account, the face seemed plump and round, the eyes and nose were small, the former were of light grey in colour, and the mouth was large. She described the jawbone as straight, which made the face look short, and the forehead, nose and chin were white, with one side of the face being bright pink. The head was very round, and from it grew long green hair that had an oily cast. The waves pushed the hair over the face. She continued that the creature seemed to be annoyed by this, and as the waves retreated with both its hands, frequently threw back the hair. The mermaid then proceeded to rub her smooth and slender throat, clearing it from any stray strands or debris. Her arms were long and slender, like her hands and fingers, but they were not webbed. One of the arms frequently extended over its head as if to frighten a bird, and it seemed to cause distress. A little distance away, the group observed a seal, and the mermaid seemed to lay her hand under her cheek. No one saw any scales, but they were taken by the smoothness of her skin. For around an hour, they watched her. As the sun was shining, and she was only a few yards away from them, they had a clear view of her. Miss Mackay made it very clear to Mrs Innes that I have stated nothing but what I clearly recollect. Both she and her cousin, a Miss C. Mackenzie, had always believed mermaids and the like from legend were complete fiction and informed Mrs Innes that our evidence cannot be biased by any former prejudice in favour of the existence of this wonderful creature. It is now presumed to be a hoax. But was it? In the summer of that same year, the Reverend William Munro, the parochial schoolmaster at Ray, wrote a letter to Dr Torrance of Thurso on 9th June about something he'd witnessed, but 
which he had not believed possible. Unconvinced of all the stories of mermaids, his beliefs too were put to the test at Ray. Torrance was well known for his interest in mermaids, which is why Monroe contacted him. The minister was aware of the scepticism which was prevalent among the well-educated people about the existence of such phenomenon. Therefore, taking it on merit, the doctor was sincere about his investigations into them, Monroe wrote a description of what he saw. During a warm summer's day in 1807, while he was walking along Sandside Beach, he decided to extend his walk and go to Sandside Head, when his attention was drawn to a female figure sitting upon a rock extending into the sea. The creature was combing its long brown hair, which flowed around its shoulders. Its resemblance to its prototype in all its visible parts was so striking that, had not the rocks on which it was sitting been dangerous for bathing, he thought he would have regarded it as a human being. And to anyone unaccustomed to such a sight, it must have appeared as such. The mermaid's head was covered with hair, but shaded on the crown. The forehead was round, and she had a plump face with ruddy cheeks, blue eyes, and the mouth and lips resembling those of a human. The mouth remained closed, so Monroe couldn't tell Torrance if the creature had teeth or what they looked like. Naked from the waist up, the breasts and abdomen were human-like. He noted the fingers, which he thought from where he stood weren't webbed, but he couldn't be sure. The mermaid remained on the rock for three or four minutes, spending all that time combing her hair, which he described as long and thick. She then dropped into the sea, which was level with her abdomen, and he never saw her again. His letter continued that he had a good view and was able to distinguish the features clearly as she sat on the rock only feet away from him, with the sun beating down on her. He went on to state the mermaid had looked directly at him, as the eyes were directed towards the eminence on which he stood. Previously he had heard reports of these creatures from several people, including some whose honesty he'd never heard questioned. Until he saw the mermaid himself, though, he didn't believe their testimonies. He wrote that it was only by seeing the phenomenon I was perfectly convinced of its existence. Monroe ended his letter, If the above narrative can, in any degree, be subservient towards the establishing the existence of a phenomenon hitherto almost incredible to naturalists, or to remove the scepticism of others, who are ready to dispute everything which they cannot fully comprehend, you are welcome to it. It appears this account of the sighting of a mermaid was not a hoax, but sceptics were not convinced. In 1849, having read several eyewitness accounts, including the letter from Miss Mackay to Mrs Innes, James Taylor, a friend of both Monroe and the Mackays, wrote to the John O'Groat Journal, stating that his friend would only write what he knew to be true. He stated, It would be superfluous in me to say that my friend, Mr Monroe's name and character as a Christian and otherwise, were far above that of lending his testimony to any circumstance he was not fully convinced of, and stated the letter he wrote to Torrance was, conclusive of the fact. The letter he'd seen by Miss Mackay also appeared to be an honest account of what she saw. He stated that the Mackay family were patterns of virtue and that it would have been impossible that Miss Mackay, 
her cousin and others, could say, much less sit down and write, what was false. The story of these sightings of the mermaids at Ray persist to this day, although none have been seen in a long time. <laughs>